Hello, everybody. Gratitude to everybody for listening. And additional heaps of gratitude to everybody who donates to the Patreon account. You keep the show going with your donations. As I keep the expenses paid, the more content I can create. You can donate at www.patreon.com slash leader1. Or, if you'd like to make a one-time donation, you can send one through PayPal at morganrector331 at hotmail.com. Remember, there is no minimum donation, no maximum donation. If $1 a month is all you feel like you can manage, especially in these difficult times, it's still appreciated. Thank you for everything, and enjoy the show. Welcome to Human Monsters. Carl Eugene Watts was born in Killeen, Texas on November 7, 1953. Soon after his birth, the family returned to his parents' home state of Virginia. In 1955, Eugene's father Richard left the family. His mother Dorothy moved him and his sister Sharon to the greater Detroit area, settling in a small town called Inkster. Dorothy became an art teacher after she and her children got settled. Carl would spend most of his youth in Inkster, but he frequently visited his grandmother in West Virginia. It was during his rabbit hunting excursions during these trips that he learned how to kill. His grandfather taught him the tricks of the trade, not just killing, but skinning the rabbits as well. They saw the rabbit pelts as trophies for their efforts. Carl was a well-behaved boy, just as comfortable in the company of women as with men, due to having been raised almost entirely by his mother. Even as a teenager, while his male contemporaries enjoyed cruising, carousing, and chasing skirt, Carl was content to remain at home. Carl struggled at school due to a learning disability. Though he persevered, always determined to do well in spite of this obstacle. It took him twice as long as other kids to do this work, but he was willing to put in the effort. Carl's intellectual disabilities were exacerbated when he was stricken with meningitis. When he was examined by doctors, they discovered that the meningitis was compounded by polio. The treatments were so intense and painful, they caused him to cry out. He was so ill and reacted so strongly to the treatments that he was quarantined from the other patients. Aside from the physical and psychological scars his condition left behind, Carl also missed a year of school. When he did return, he struggled to keep up with the class. The illness wreaked havoc with his attention span. He couldn't focus, no matter how hard he tried. His memory was also impaired. He worked hard to bring up his grades, but it was all in vain. Carl's private life also changed dramatically. His mother met a new man. He already had six children, and with Dorothy, he would have two more. Though the house was now crowded, it didn't bother Carl. He was an introvert who was not inclined to battle for time in the limelight. This didn't mean that he didn't possess strong feelings. He just bottled them up. Unlike many serial killers who were abused growing up and expressed their homicidal urges in childhood by torturing and murdering animals, none of this was applicable to Carl Watts, his hunting trips with his grandfather notwithstanding. While Carl was unable to excel academically, he succeeded at sports to the point where he was ranked among the best athletes in his school. Boxing was something about which he was passionate. He became competitive, even winning the Golden Gloves title in the rank of middleweight. His boxing career ended the moment he took a punch. He could dish it out just fine, but the moment he got a taste of it, 
he retired. Carl's 15th year was when he gave up on any possibility that scholarship was worth pursuing. He was reading at a fourth grade level, and there was no sign he was going to improve. It was about this time that Carl ran afoul of the law for the first time. It was 1969, and he was still 15 years old. He was working a paper route at the time. This had nothing to do with embezzling money from his customers' subscription fees. It, no, it was something far more malevolent. One June morning at 7.30, while delivering papers, he spotted a 26-year-old white woman by the name of Joan Gave. She was one of Watts's regular customers. He rang her doorbell. Joan answered the door in short order. Almost as if Carl's arm had been attached to the hinges with some kind of hydraulic device, the moment she opened the door, Joan received a punch in the face. Carl continued punching her, and whether or not his intention had been to knock her unconscious, she began screaming, which negated any possibility that he could have gotten away with it. Carl panicked and left. He couldn't have been all that terrified of retaliation from the police. He finished the rest of his route before heading home. Four days later, the police showed up at the Watts homestead. They had a warrant to arrest Carl. When he was taken into custody, he wasn't rattled in the slightest. When he was questioned about his modus operandi, Carl said his reason for attacking this woman with no provocation on her part was simply that he felt the urge to beat someone up. Typically, that kind of crime would land an offender his age in a juvenile detention hall. Instead, his honesty and acceptance of his detention, bizarre as it was, brought him to the Lafayette Mental Clinic in Detroit for evaluation and treatment. During his examination in Lafayette, the staff were bent on determining if Watts was a sex offender. After all, his victim had been a woman, even if he hadn't molested or raped her. What they found was that there was no kind of sexual impropriety in his childhood to speak of. Aside from losing his virginity at the age of 14, he hadn't expended much energy in chasing skirt. Part of the blame for this was his mother's puritanical view that sex was wicked behavior and he was discouraged from pursuing casual sexual encounters. More disturbing, he disclosed to the doctors that he sometimes had harrowing dreams involving violence against women. Occasionally, he even dreamed that he murdered females. When asked how the dreams made him feel, he said that he usually woke up feeling better. After several weeks of intensive treatment, Carl was found to be incapable of feeling remorse for the assault on Joan Gave. His mother and stepfather were at a loss to explain his behavior. They noted that he occasionally bullied his younger sister, though it was consistent with garden-variety sibling rivalry. One Dr. Ainsworth concluded that Carl was a paranoid young man who struggled to repress the violent and occasionally homicidal impulses that overtook his mind. Carl also demonstrated that his capacity to control his behavior was not entirely functional. Taking this all into consideration, he didn't rule out the possibility that he might act out in a violent fashion in the future. In closing, Dr. Ainsworth noted that Carl Watts should be considered a dangerous individual. Carl was discharged on November 7, 1969, after two months of treatment. Staff of Lafayette advised his parents that he be treated as an outpatient. Regular checkups were recommended, but there was little in the way of active follow-up. This was a period of transition for Carl Watts in a whole other respect. He was experimenting with drugs, namely cannabis, amphetamines, and other pills. Carl's social life didn't improve much. His social circle had been small, and due to his avoidant behavior, it began to close in further. He got into trouble at school because of the ways in which he interacted with girls which was considered unacceptable. Little was done to remedy the situation. 
When he wasn't being rough with females, he vented his aggressive feelings in the boxing ring and football field. He had a great deal of unresolved anger since his parents, especially his stepfather, were abusive. His stepfather was physically abusive, especially when he was drunk, which was often. He claimed his mother was equally as violent, but other family members have denied this. Whether or not this was true, she loved her son enough to pay special attention to him as he attended to his schoolwork. It was due to her assistance that he was able to graduate high school. He was successful enough to receive a football scholarship to Lane College in Jackson, Tennessee. This institution had a predominantly African-American student body, which added to its appeal. He hoped that one day it might lead to a spot playing in the NFL. Carl's hopes were dashed after three months at Lane College. A knee injury that never completely mended took him off the field. Carl went back to Detroit with his tail between his legs. He worked for the subsequent six months as a mechanic in one of the wheel manufacturers. 1974. Carl reported to the Lafayette Hospital for a checkup. He told the doctors that his life and his mind had changed very little. He still felt the same violent impulses and urges. There was new information to report, however. During an evaluation, Carl revealed that he was experiencing troubles and doubts about his sexual orientation, that he feared he might be gay. These urges all emerged from a haze of violent pathology. The doctors labeled them primitive thoughts, which they felt originated from within his subconscious. For a time, Carl was diligent about keeping his violent urges and impulses in check. He was more concerned about pursuing a post-secondary education. He was accepted into a grant program that was created at a community college for minority students. He studied engineering and worked in the cafeteria. This enabled him to move out of his parents' home and into a dorm room. This in and of itself became problematic. He now had freedom he had never had before. He spent a lot of time playing ping-pong in the rec room when he should have been studying and attending classes. It also meant that he had more time to let his violent impulses stew and boil inside of him. He got into trouble with the law at this time, though it was not nearly as serious as his first charge. He was caught stealing plywood from the campus. He was arrested by campus police, but he was released with a warning. Carl's next brush with the law came within weeks, and this was considerably more serious. On October 25th at 11 a.m., Lenore Knizatsky was alone in their door room when there was a knock on the door. When she answered, she was greeted by the sight of a well-groomed and handsome African-American man. It wasn't at all what she expected. She was puzzled. He said, Is Charles home? No one named Charles resided in the apartment. She told him politely that nobody named Charles lived there. She suggested he try one of the neighbors. When he turned and walked away, she closed the door. Just under ten minutes later, there was another knock on Lenore's door. She opened the door with the chain in the slot to allow only a minimal amount of space through which to view the inquiring party. It was the same man as before. Once more, he asked if Charles was home. This time, there seemed to be some feeling of urgency rising in him. Lenore offered to write Charles a note and leave it around for him. She turned from the door to get a paper and pen. She let the chain off the hook in the process. While Lenore's back was turned, Carl burst through the door and leapt at Lenore. He jumped onto her and lodged a knee into her chest. He placed his hands around her throat. She was unable to wrest herself free. Carl freed one hand and reached down to her groin. She tried to scream, but he squeezed her throat with too much force to allow the requisite amount of air in or out. His hand continued to constrict her throat, and her breathing was becoming increasingly labored. Just before she passed out, he fled the scene. 
She reported the incident to the police, but her memory was spotty. The police were not able to find anyone based on her description. The best leads to come in regarded complaints about a man who had been loitering around an apartment complex and knocking on doors, looking for a man named Charles. October 30th. A 19-year-old psychology student and mother was found dead in her apartment. Her body was found with 33 knife wounds. All cuts were made in the form of slashes across her chest. Her windpipe was crushed. She had been stabbed with some kind of instrument that would normally be used to carve wood. The murder weapon was wielded with so much aggression it was broken. It was lodged deep inside her spine. Nothing was stolen from the victim's apartment, and she had not been raped. There were no witnesses. The only clue came in a report from a resident of the same tenement, who noted that they saw an African-American male walking through the corridors of the building around the same time the murder is alleged to have occurred. He was seen walking up to a door, knocking, and asking the occupant if Charles was inside. When the tenant asked him why he was there, he responded with melancholy, as if this derailment had shocked and saddened him. He said he didn't know and walked away. The victim's name was Gloria Steele, and people who knew her well were dumbfounded that such a kind and mild-mannered girl would become the target of such a vicious attack. Her boyfriend Sam Waller was suspected. He was perceived as a dodgy character due to his use of hard drugs. Though he confessed to having purchased heroin the night of Gloria's murder, he insisted that he kept his addiction secret from most people he knew and that Gloria never did drugs. One factor complicating the investigation was that Gloria's family cleaned her apartment after her body was taken away. The local police chief, John Cease, has stated that, if not for this, his crew might have solved the murder in three days. He suspected Carl Watts, but after Gloria's family meddled with the crime scene, there was no way to prove his culpability. The best article of evidence the investigators had was the murder weapon, though considering it was still lodged in the victim's spine, they would have to wait until it was extracted. Cease has described the murder as among the most brutal he has ever investigated. November 16th, a woman named Diane K. Williams observed an African-American man wandering around her apartment building. She was the resident manager, so it was her duty to keep abreast of any developments that might pose a threat to the tenants. Any strangers not welcomed into a resident's apartment were to be viewed with suspicion. She asked a few of the tenants if they had come into contact with the man. She discovered that he was knocking on doors and asking people if a Charles was home. Nobody knew about the murder of Gloria Steele, but there was still something dodgy about the man's behavior. The man knocked on Diane's door. She was more curious than frightened. The man asked her about a man named Charles. She offered to take a message for him. This occurred just after noon. When she passed the paper through the door to him, he yanked it from her hand and attempted to force his way in. He slammed the door inward and forced Diane further into her apartment. He grabbed her by the throat and began to strangle her. Just then, the telephone began to ring. Diane managed to knock the headset off. She couldn't reach the headset on the floor, but she screamed downward to it, begging whoever had called for help. The person on the other line was her husband's secretary. The assailant panicked and fled the scene. Diane ran to her window. She saw him run to his car outside. She noted the color and model as he sped away. She called the police immediately after. The police used the information provided by Diane Williams to track down Carl Watts. He was brought into the police station to stand as part of a lineup. Diane and Lenore Knazaski picked him out easily. That very day, Carl Watts was arrested and received two charges of assault and battery. 
While in custody, Watts admitted to being in the apartment block where Gloria Steele was murdered, but he denied having killed her. He even offered to undergo a polygraph examination. He demanded to see his lawyer immediately after, and he was soon released. December. During the first week of the month, investigations were underway. Carl Watts was out on bond for the crimes he was accused of having committed, but he was brought back into the police department for further questioning. After a lengthy interrogation, he confessed to assaulting as many as 15 women. He was 21 years old at this point. He gave a list of the women he'd assailed, and the descriptions were nearly uniform. Young, attractive, white women with a thin build. He was on a roll. According to Watts, he was committing an average of two attacks a week. As soon as he divulged this incriminating information, he suddenly turned silent and insisted on being represented by an attorney for any further questioning. After conferring with the legal representative, he took his advice and voluntarily committed himself to a state psychiatric ward. Not even his lawyer disagreed that the streets were not safe for women as long as Watts walked free, and this solution was utilized. After Watts was admitted to the Kalamazoo Mental Hospital, police searched his apartment. They didn't find any evidence linking Watts to the murder of Gloria Steele. They could only bust him for the theft of the plywood. For that, he was sentenced to 45 days in prison or a mental health institution. Watts opted to serve the rest of his sentence in the hospital. One of his attendant physicians, Dr. James Cotillius, noted that Watts appeared to possess no special preoccupations and did not demonstrate any symptoms of a psychotic disorder. In fact, the doctor's opinion was that all of Carl Watts's mental faculties were intact. The only aberration Dr. Cotillius detected was antisocial personality disorder, or the potential to be a sociopath. He also felt his capacity for impulse control was impaired, and that he didn't appear to learn from his mistakes. He was far more given to blaming others for his transgressions. Well, that latter point wasn't entirely accurate. He learned enough from his actions to avoid making mistakes that might result in him getting caught. January 8, 1975. Carl Watts was cognizant of the dormant evil that resided within him. It had already compelled him to commit acts of an unspeakable evil against others. He already had a body count. Unable to live with it any longer, he wrapped a cord around his neck and hung himself while still in the hospital. A nurse intervened in time and cut him free before he asphyxiated. He hadn't even passed out. Carl Watts was released back into society, having at this time been perceived as more of a threat to himself than to society. Police still suspected him of being a murderer, but they lacked the requisite evidence to issue a warrant for his arrest to make a homicide charge stick. They had gathered enough evidence to charge him with assault, but if he was a murderer, they couldn't afford to set him loose in the community after a few charges for assault, whose penalties paled in comparison to the sentence he would have received for murder. Months later, in June, Watts returned to the hospital for a checkup. He was interviewed by the Center for Forensic Psychiatry. He was open about his violent impulses. He told them that assaulting women made him feel good. The doctors felt that he did not suffer from any particular personality disorder, at least none that would negate his ability to stand trial. He was lucid, but also, in their estimation, quite dangerous. It was their opinion that his chances of assaulting other women was exceedingly high. Carl asked for help during his time at the hospital, though it wasn't psychiatric help. He wanted legal advice. He was hoping they could tell him how he could avoid going to prison. He wanted tips on how he could appear mentally ill to the point of dysfunction, rather than an unrepentant sadist. He admitted that he felt no remorse nor empathy for his victims. 
He was only worried about getting caught and ending up incarcerated. December 19, 1975, the day of Carl Watts' trial. He was charged with the two assaults and pled no contest to both. He could not avoid a one-year prison sentence. The police could not ignore the nagging suspicion that the women of their community would not be safe after he was released. Still, there was the burden of proof. For what they suspected him of doing, a one-year sentence was practically a slap on the wrist. August 24, 1976. Carl Watts was released from the Kalamazoo County Jail. He moved back in with his family. For the time being, he kept a low profile, as word had gotten out about the trouble he had gotten into. The next few months of Carl Watts's life were quiet and normal. He even entered into consensual relations with a woman named Dolores Howard. She was still in high school, so it was about as normal as relationships got for Carl Watts. At one point, he got her pregnant. He was not remembered as an overly sentimental or romantic boyfriend. February 3, 1979, Carl's daughter, Nakisha Watts, was born. Carl did not take to fatherhood, holding increasingly aloof to the child and spending more and more time away from home. At one point, he denied paternity altogether. He finally abandoned both mother and daughter without even telling them where he was headed. Dolores requested through the courts that he pay $70 a week in child support, but he could not be relied upon to pony up the money when required. She didn't pursue the matter much further, happy as she was to see the last of him. In the meantime, Carl married a woman named Valeria Goodwill. They married five months after the baby was born. He didn't value people anyway, especially not women. Valeria was troubled by Carl's night terrors. Whatever phantom threat he was dreaming about, he would swing against it in reality. His behavior became erratic elsewhere and at other times. He was fired from the automotive manufacturing company he worked for due to shoddy work. He was losing his ability to focus. He spent the time he should have used to find a new job instead just sitting around the house. He fidgeted and he was mentally unstable. He rearranged the furniture obsessively. Carl slipped into a malaise and his appearance was as slovenly as the house was cluttered. It was not in keeping with his nature, but suddenly he was littering indoors, leaving food wrappers and napkins all over the place. He trashed the place, with their house running to squalor. His behavior became even more bizarre. He would pick up a knife in the kitchen and cut up the house plants. He would cut up candles and melt them onto the surface of the kitchen table. His behavior was getting increasingly strange still. One day he turned to Valeria and announced that he no longer believed in God. This declaration came out of nowhere after she began to talk about putting up a Christmas tree. This suggestion aroused considerable anger in Carl. He instituted new rules for Valeria specifically, like she was forbidden from wearing cosmetics or beauty products of any kind, including wigs. One day he grabbed one of her wigs in a fury and flushed it down the toilet in a huff. Valeria didn't know what to make of all this, but she was definitely puzzled and worried about what he was likely to do next. Eventually it just led to constant frustration. One of his most vexing habits was disappearing at night. He would be gone for hours on end. When he returned, he would be disheveled and out of his mind. Sometimes his clothing was torn. One pattern Valeria observed was that he would leave the house soon after they had had sex. He would simply get up, get dressed, and leave the house. He would get in the car and drive away. She had no idea what was going on during that time. October 17, 1979. Carl Watts was arrested. He was found by police prowling outside a woman's home in the neighborhood of Southfield. He had driven there shortly after having sex with Valeria. The police responded to a report of 
disorderly prowling. When they found the suspect in question, he ran, and they chased him. They caught him and took him into the station. They called Valeria and threw Carl into a holding cell. The charges were dropped, but now Valeria at least had some inkling of what Carl was doing those hours after he disappeared. The only real penalty was the $25 in fines he accumulated for reckless driving and driving without headlights. This incident brought him to the attention of Detroit police who were investigating a string of attacks on women. The pattern was that the assailant would break into the victim's home as they slept and find the bedroom. He would stand over the victim as she left before placing his hand over either her mouth her breast, or her groin. Because this always occurred late at night, none of the victims could clearly describe the offender. Their description could have been a match for hundreds or thousands of men who lived in the greater Detroit area. What they didn't know was that the attacker was just getting his feet wet. The worst was yet to come. October 8, 1979. 22-year-old Peggy Pokmara was found in the front yard of her boyfriend's home. She was dead. Police detected no signs of a robbery or sexual assault. She had simply been strangled and left for dead. There was no indication of who was responsible for the attack. There was no sexual or financial motivation. When the killer liked to kill for the sake of killing, it made them that much harder to catch. October 31st, 44-year-old Jeannie Klein was found murdered. She was stabbed 13 times and left outside her home in Gross Point Farms. She was neither robbed nor raped. The coroner determined that the murder must have taken place at about 6.45 p.m., just about time for the trick-or-treaters to begin knocking on doors. It was a very serendipitous time to leave a dead body lying around. The only lead the police had to go on was that the suspect was a well-built African-American male, but with at least 25% of the city's population fitting that description, it wasn't much help. December 1st. The body of Helen May Dutcher was found dead. She had been stabbed 12 times. She was dumped outside H&M Cleaners, just north of Woodlawn Cemetery. No robbery, no rape. Two more bodies were found before the closing days of 1979. Don Jerome was found dead hours after being choked to death. Malak Haddad was found in Allen Park. She was decapitated. Police never found her head. Police estimated that she was walking when the attack began. Malak Haddad's murder was the first to rattle the community at large. Body parts were now being severed. The general public began to muse openly about the possibility of a serial killer in their midst. March 10, 1980. 23-year-old Hazel Kniff's dead body was found. She had been strangled and left in a driveway in Detroit. She was found in the yard of her boyfriend's house. Her corpse was tied to a chain-link fence. It was strung up into a sitting position. She was asphyxiated with her own belt. There were no signs of rape or robbery. Three weeks later, the body of 26-year-old Denise Dunmore was found in a parking lot. She hadn't been robbed or raped. April 20th, 17-year-old Shirley Small was found dead just 70 feet from her family's house. She was last seen alive at 4.30 a.m., by neighbors while she had an argument with her boyfriend. This was one of the grisliest of the murders. She was stabbed to death with two incisions made in her chest directly above her heart. The autopsy revealed that the killer made two precisely executed incisions with one blunt instrument. A scalpel has been considered as a possibility. They took great care to plunge the blade straight into her heart. Sadly, these were not the only injuries visited upon Shirley. The perpetrator cut six long and deep slices into her face. 
Two were made on each cheek. One of them measured at close to three and a half inches. There was a cut on her upper lip. An upper cut was made just above her right eyebrow. Shirley was neither robbed nor raped. Her purse was left with money inside by her corpse. The killer just wanted to render a woman powerless before he tortured her. He just wanted to make her suffer. Valeria Goodwill, after less than a year of matrimony, decided to leave Carl and file for divorce. His strange behavior and frequent disappearances became more than she could accept. May 31st, the body of 27-year-old Linda Montero was discovered just outside her house. She was strangled. She was killed as she was returning from choir practice at her church. There was no evidence of theft or sexual assault. Just as the police were getting caught up in their investigative protocols, a new outbreak of femicide struck in July. July 13th, 26-year-old Glenda Richmond was found dead next to her apartment complex in Ann Arbor. This was an especially gruesome murder as she was stabbed 28 times in her left breast. Her purse was left unriffled, and though her blouse was pulled up, exposing her midriff, there were no indications of sexual assault. July 31st, 28-year-old Lily Dunn was kidnapped from her driveway at about 3 a.m. There were witnesses to this crime. They reported that they saw Lily kicking and screaming in her fight against an assailant who was trying to drag her to his car. When the witnesses rushed over to intervene, the attacker drove away. Lily dropped some of her personal effects, like her shoes, a hairbrush, and a purse. Those items represented all the police could find. Her body was never located. That same day, there were reports that another woman was attacked, Irene Kondradowitz, from Windsor, Canada. After a night of partying at bars, she was attacked from behind, whereupon the aggressor slashed her throat. The wound was serious, but she survived. She was unable to provide the police with an accurate description of him since he assaulted her from behind and she didn't get a good look at him. September 14th, 20-year-old Rebecca Greer Huff was found near her apartment building around 4 a.m. This was a particularly vicious murder. She was stabbed 54 times with a screwdriver that had a shaft measuring at a quarter of an inch. She was stabbed 15 times in her heart, with four strikes affecting her left lung. Her liver was cut six times. There were 28 holes in her blouse. She was not robbed or raped. While the police were reluctant to do so publicly, the local media shed light on a pattern. The victims were all white, young, and attractive. The killings typically took place in the early morning hours of a Sunday. None of the victims were pilfered of money or valuables. They were not sexually assaulted. The perpetrator was dubbed the Sunday Morning Slasher, and this moniker went into common usage within hours. Now that the women of the greater Detroit area were deemed to be unsafe, the police created a task force specifically to identifying and arresting the perpetrator. One investigating officer, Sergeant James Arthurs, was especially helpful. When he was briefed about the crimes of the Sunday morning slasher, it brought to mind an attack he recalled from years before. Arthurs remembered a crime from 1969 when a paper boy assaulted a woman named Joan Gave. The attack was carried out in a very similar way to the methodology employed by the Sunday Morning Slasher. Realizing the similarities were too numerous to dismiss out of hand, he gave his colleagues the name of the offender, Carl Eugene Watts. This was a valuable lead, but there was a list of other suspects, and ultimately there was not yet any tangible evidence linking Carl Watts to the crimes. Especially problematic was that he matched the physical profile of the other suspects. It would be a while before they could narrow the leads down to one man. October 6th, 
20-year-old Sandra Delpe was attacked by the Sunday morning slasher, but survived. Unlike the other survivors, she was able to provide a more detailed description of the attacker. She was assaulted close to her home. The attack began when the assailant plunged a knife deeply into her right shoulder blade. The blade sank so deep that, along with leaving a three-inch wound behind, it also punctured a lung and broke some of her ribs. Sandy was informed by doctors that the blade missed her heart by half an inch. This wasn't the fullest extent of the damage. The perpetrator pulled the knife out and slashed her across her neck. He pulled the knife out once more and cut a two-inch gash on her left shoulder. Though she survived, she was in so much pain and weakened by so much blood loss, she was unable to defend herself. The pain was excruciating. He wasn't finished. He slashed at her face twice in a J formation in parallel across her cheek. One cut ran from her mouth to her ear. The other was shorter and located just beneath. The damage was not just skin deep. The external jugular vein and muscles in her face and neck, including the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which enables one to rotate their head, were damaged. The spinal accessory nerve and the facial nerve were severed, which left some muscles in this area paralyzed and others weak. Some of the muscles in that region of her head have atrophied. This left her with lifelong disabilities. Despite physical therapy and medical care, she struggles to eat, lift her arms above a certain height, and turn her head in certain directions. Needless to say, it destroyed her life. What she recalled about the attacker was that she saw him sitting at a bus stop before she went to work. She said there was something about his countenance that suggested he was eccentric or in need of some kind of assistance. She considered approaching him to ask how she could help, but her bus was arriving, so she left. She never forgot his face. She also saw that face in his car when it was parked outside the school where she was attending night classes. That night, shortly before she was attacked, she remembered seeing someone poised in the bushes, bent and crouching. She even saw the glimmer of a shiny object. Her impression at the time was that he was looking for something. Such was her degree of innocence and magnanimity that she always assumed the best of everybody's intentions. November 1st. Another visitor from Windsor, 30-year-old Mary Angus, was arriving home after Halloween celebrations. As she was headed to her apartment complex, an African-American man in a gray hoodie was walking in her direction. She had read about the Sunday morning slasher, so she was wary of approaching men at that hour. When she looked in his direction, he squatted, seemingly to tie his shoelaces. As Mary pulled out her keys, he ran towards her. Mary wasn't able to get inside, but she did scream. It was a primal scream, loud enough that it startled the man, and he ran away. Fortunately, she not only remembered what he looked like, but reported the incident to the police. Upon request, Mary went to a police station for questioning. She was presented with an assembly of photographs and was asked to select the offender that most closely resembled her attacker. She chose a photo of Carl Watts. The police had been checking security footage from the Canada-U.S. border and noticed that a car matching the make and model that Watts drove commuted across the border the night before the incident. This was not enough information to qualify for an arrest warrant, however. November 6th, 63-year-old Lena Bennett was found dead naked and hanging from a tree. This was a game changer. This was the first of the Sunday morning slashing victims to be raped. She was also the oldest victim, more than twice as old as Mary Angus, who was 30. Lena was hung with a black trench coat belt. Another distinctive detail, a broomstick had been thrusted into her vagina. November 15th, a new break. Carl Watts was witnessed following a woman. 
two beat cops on patrol stumbled upon this development by chance. Solving cases often depends on luck. Watts was following her in the car he was known to drive, a brown 1978 Pontiac Grand Prix, though stalking would be more precise. After a few minutes of this, the car accelerated and drove ahead. The Grand Prix pulled into a parking space about a block ahead of the woman. She appeared to be ignorant of the fact that she was being tracked. Not for long, she spotted him in his car, and the attention was unnerving. She ran around a corner and walked up another direction. Watts started his car and resumed his pursuit of the woman. The woman was becoming more and more uneasy. It made sense. Every woman in the greater Detroit area knew about the Sunday morning slasher and were advised to keep their eyes peeled during the early morning hours of Sunday. She made her way along as fast as she could. Sometimes she would pause in front of an apartment or in other locations where there were bound to be witnesses. This went on for nine blocks. Though the officers wanted to bust him, they needed him to launch an attack before they could legitimately charge him with a violent crime. Fortunately for this woman, she managed to escape before being attacked, though it was bad news for the rest of Detroit's female population, who were still unsafe. Still, the fact that Carl Watts was observed during the stalking phase of these crimes would ensure that the paper trail leading to an arrest warrant was sure to lead all the way to his door. According to officers who witnessed this incident, Watts went nuts. He was greatly unsettled by his failure to assault this woman. He jumped out of the car and searched the neighborhood on foot in hopes of finding the woman. He didn't. Instead, he was found by two police officers. He fled on foot. The cops pursued him in their cruiser and caught up with him. He was taken into custody. There was nothing heavy duty they could charge him with. He was driving with a suspended license and expired license tags, but it was something. It meant they could put him in a cell until they figured out how to proceed. For one thing, they wanted to search his car, which they did. One odd item of note they found in the car was a dictionary. This was noteworthy because of words that were etched into the cover. Those words were, Rebecca is a lover. This was a possible reference to the death of Rebecca Huff. They also found traces of blood. The long process of analysis would prove if it were a match for the victims of a Sunday morning slasher. An assemblage of wood carving tools were found. The Sunday morning slasher was known to use unorthodox murder weapons, so these were noted. Though he was led to believe he was only brought in for driving violations, Watts was twitching as if he had something considerably graver on his mind. Detective Paul Bunton used the Reed technique. The Reed technique is described as creating a high pressure environment for the interviewee, followed by sympathy and offers of understanding and help but only if a confession is forthcoming. Detective Paul Bunton, without going into detail, told Watts he knew what he had been up to. He didn't go into specifics about what this consisted, and he told him he couldn't prove it yet, but that he would. Watts wasn't about to take any chances. He told Bunton he wanted a lawyer. Since there was no evidence that Watts was the Sunday morning strangler, the best option for Bunton was to observe protocol and grant Watts his singular phone call. There was no way to bust him for the murders of which he was suspected, so he was released. However, while he was free to walk the streets, his movements would be observed by the watchful eye of the law. The police gathered all the information they could find about Carl Watts. Speaking with mental health experts, and law enforcement entities who had handled cases involving Watts, Paul Bunton was advised that the profile of the Sunday morning slasher likely bore more than a passing resemblance to that of Carl Eugene Watts. Bearing this in mind, the police launched a 24-hour surveillance operation to track Watts' every move. One obstacle they faced was that Watts sometimes crossed the border to offend in Canada. Collaborating with law enforcement agencies from other countries was a complicated affair, 
since arrest protocols and differences in the criminal codes would likely differ in some ways. Still, they became aware of an attack that happened in Windsor, Ontario. On November 20th, 60-year-old Rita Pardo was attacked in the laundry room of her apartment complex. A young man unknown to her walked in. She described him as wearing dark pants and a dress shirt beneath a light-colored trench coat. He waited for Rita to turn her back to him, whereupon he grabbed her from behind and tried to choke her to death. Before finishing the job, Rita was able to scream for help. The attacker fled the laundry room and left the building. Though border customs footage contained no images of Watts' car, witnesses said they saw him around Rita Pardo's building that day. Police departments from both Detroit and Windsor were now collaborating in their efforts to catch Carl Watts and bring him to justice. Watts was being followed every second he appeared in public. It appeared he must have been cognizant of this because he would often get out of his car at intersections and scream at other motorists, likely suspecting them of being undercover cops. Other curious behavior consisted of lengthy excursions in his car. He might drive for as much as 300 miles outside the city limits. Now that Watts knew the police were on to him, they realized it was time to turn up the heat. They were successful in obtaining search warrants, both for Watts' apartment in the district of Inkster and the home of his mother and stepfather. The closest the investigators came to finding evidence of the murders was when they found a tennis shoe in Carl Watts' mother's home. There was blood on the shoe, but the blood could not be traced to any of the Sunday morning slasher victims, so the lead became a dead end. Though evidence gathering was done as part of the police's efforts to prove Watts was the Sunday morning slasher, it was more of a scheme to unnerve Watts. It seemed to be working, especially after the police placed tracking devices under Watts' car. Now it seemed as though they had clairvoyant powers and appeared almost out of thin air. It was about this time that Detroit's overall murder and violent crime rate saw a marked decrease. The warrant issued for the tracking device was to expire on January 29, 1981. The police decided to move in at this point. They felt the best move was to place Carl Watts under arrest while he was visiting his family's home. They took him to the Detroit Police Department for questioning. This time he was interrogated by the homicide section. Watts was subjected to five hours of intensive questioning. Paul Bunton questioned him once again. To his surprise, Watts was tranquil and soft-spoken the entire time. Most of his answers were terse, monosyllabic, and unhelpful. The closest Watts came to confessing was admitting that he was possibly emotionally ill. Paul Bunton decided to try the read technique once again. This time he would inform Watts that not only did he know he was the Sunday morning slasher, but that he was well versed in his methodology. Bunton went as far as to get up, walk around the table, and grab Watts lightly by the throat to demonstrate how the victims were attacked. From there, he went through the murders with every detail from every briefing he'd heard about every murder that Watts was alleged to have committed. As he narrated their way through each murder, he employed the pronoun you to make Watts the protagonist of his own true horror story. Examples would be statements like, you grabbed her throat and choked her, and you stabbed her in the shoulder blade. Paul Bunton may not have broken the skin or left a bruise, but he did touch a nerve. Watts broke down and cried. However, he did not confess. Instead, he demanded to see his mother. A call was made to Watts' mother, but this did nothing to elicit a disclosure. In fact, Watts was even more tight-lipped than ever. There was even worse news. A blood sample was taken from Watts to see if it matched up with blood that was taken from the crime scenes. It did not. Paul Bunton watched helplessly as Carl Watts left the building once again, a free man. It was discouraging, but he wasn't ready to give up. 
Bunchen became personally involved with the surveillance, and the many times he and Watts crossed paths in the coming weeks weren't exactly coincidental. He followed him everywhere, even when Watts frequented crowded public areas like shopping malls. With the police up his ass in Detroit, Carl Watts decided the best option for him was to flee the city. After spending some time with his grandmother in Coalfield, West Virginia, he moved to his home state of Texas. The move was necessitated by the comparably better prospects of finding employment. He was informed by friends that Houston presented plenty of opportunities, so it was to that city that he relocated. Though he hoped Detroit police would not find out where he had gone, he made the mistake of having his employer send his last paycheck to his new address in Houston. Paul Bunton now knew where he was hiding. Though he had no jurisdiction in Texas, Bunton could not in good conscience, as a man of the law, put the safety and lives of Texan women at risk. He assembled a case file on Watts and mailed it to Texas, where it was received by Detective Doug Bostock. Though there was no evidence directly linking Watts to the Sunday morning slasher killings, he explained his theory about why he thought he was the culprit. Botock interviewed Watts' new employer. His new boss said he was thinking of firing Watts. He said that his performance was good at the outset, but that the quality was progressively slipping. He was looking for any valid excuse to fire him, but Bolstock persuaded him to keep him on. That way, Watts' life could be broken down into an observable pattern. Two months later, Watts' boss couldn't take his shoddy workmanship any longer, and he terminated him. Watts moved to Dallas and started a new job. Like Bunton before him, Bolstock prepared some materials about Watts and mailed them to Dallas police. Ultimately, Watts decided to remain in Houston. He moved frequently so that the police would struggle to keep track of him. He found a new job as a mechanic in 1981 in the town of Columbus, which is located just outside of Texas. Watts was living a normal life at that point. He became socially active and even began seeing a young woman. The efforts of police to track and investigate Watts dwindled to the point where only Doug Bostock kept it up, and it was often during his off hours. Whether he was cognizant of it or not, this was a perfect time for a serial killer to move to Houston. In 1980 alone, there were 633 homicides in the city. It became known as the murder capital of the world. Bullstock attached a tracking device to Watts's car. That was about as closely as Watts was monitored at the time. September 5th, Watts was drinking and driving in the streets of Houston. He saw a woman getting into a car. As she drove toward the outskirts of the city, he followed. He pursued her over a distance of 160 miles, going all the way to Austin. She was 22-year-old Linda Tilly, and he intended to follow her right up to her doorstep. It was while she walked toward her apartment complex that an arm reached around her neck and tried to pull her into the shadows. Linda decided she wasn't going down without a fight. Though she was smaller in build than Watts, she unleashed a flurry of punches and wrestling tactics. They wound up in a swimming pool. Unfortunately, this proved to be her undoing. Watts grabbed her head and held it underwater until she was drowned. Confident she was dead, Watts left the pool and drove from the scene. Carl Watts had luck on his side. The death of Linda Tilly was ruled by the Austin Police Department as accidental. Furthermore, they had never heard of Carl Watts. In the meantime, Carl became more settled, living a quieter life in Eagle Lake. He became employed by the city of Houston. He even began attending church regularly, where he met Sheila Williams, with whom he became romantically involved. She went on to become his common-law wife. This didn't mean that Watts' days as a murderer were over. September 12th, Elizabeth Montgomery was walking her dogs, following a dispute with a neighbor. Shortly thereafter, she was heard screaming. She fell to her knees. When the neighbor ran to investigate, 
Elizabeth was bleeding out from a stab wound in her heart. September 13th, as Susie Wolfe was walking to her front door, Carl Watts seized upon her and stabbed her nine times with a kitchen knife. The wounds were over six inches deep. She died less than 24 hours after Elizabeth Montgomery. Doug Bostock discovered that Carl Watts was working for the city as a mechanic for its public transit buses. He attached a tracking device to Watts's car, but Watts found it and it was removed. With the city distracted by municipal election, Watts was able to continue killing under the radar. January 4, 1982, Ellen Tam was found hanging from a tree by her own tube top. It was initially ruled a suicide, but her family insisted it wasn't possible, and the police eventually ruled it as being likely a homicide, which they described as clever and cunning. Later that month, Margaret Fossey was choked and stuffed into the trunk of her car. An unidentified woman's throat was slashed while she was in the act of changing a tire. That murder occurred the same night Margaret Fossey was killed. One week later, Alice Martell was assaulted as she was walking toward her door. She survived the attack, waking up later in hospital with stab wounds on her chin and chest. A night later, 19-year-old Patty Johnson was assaulted in the early morning hours when a man leapt out from hiding and slashed her throat. Fortunately for Patty, a neighbor was alerted to the commotion, and the attacker fled the scene. Patty was able to give a description of her attacker, but the man she identified was named Howard Mosley. Carl Watts continued to walk free with the streets awash with blood. Case in point. On February 6th, Emily Lacqua disappeared while hitchhiking. The bloodbath raged on. Edith Anna Stokes was stabbed 17 times in the chest. Barely an hour later, Watts attacked Glenda Kirby. Glenda survived because Watts's body was slick with Anna Stokes's blood, and this enabled Glenda to break from his grasp. April 15th, Yolanda Gracia disappeared while waiting for a bus. Her body was found the next morning in her neighbor's yard. April 16th, Carl Watts attacked Carrie Jefferson outside her home. He abducted her and stuffed her into the trunk of her own car. Her husband found the car five blocks away. It was covered with blood. The body was not found at the scene. It was never found. Around the end of April, colleagues of Sue Searles became concerned when they, she did not turn up at work, which was unlike her. When they went out to check her car, they observed that several of her belongings, which were all broken, were inside. Sue was never found, but was presumed dead. Harriet Samander was the mother of one of the murdered girls. She was frustrated by the lackadaisical efforts of the Houston Police Department to find the perpetrator of all the killings. Harriet did not have a legal background of any kind, but she launched her own investigation and was unable to rule out the possibility that the murder of her daughter and several other young women were linked to one culprit. Nobody in law or government were willing to listen, especially not during an election, when everybody was trying to score points. Harriet turned to the media. After calling the local news affiliates, Channel 11 interviewed her on the air. She shared her lone killer theory and advised the women of Houston to be vigilant. May 22nd, Michelle Mady was stalked by Carl Watts. He waited until she arrived at her door before he grabbed her throat. He pushed her into her house. Once inside, he ran a bath. Satisfied with the level of depth, he pushed Michelle's head under water until she drowned. Her mother found her the next morning. March 23rd. As Lori Lister walked up to her front door, she was intercepted by Carl Watts. He grabbed her and forced her inside. He asked her if there was anyone else in the apartment. Lori lied and said no one else lived there. 
In truth, she had a roommate named Melinda. Lori's effort to protect Melinda was undermined when Melinda stepped out of the shower wearing only a bathrobe. One of the girls screamed. Watts grabbed Melinda and tried to strangle her. Melinda decided to play possum and faked unconsciousness. She let herself go limp and fell to the floor. This fooled Watts, but he tied her up with belts. Watts caught up with Lori and dragged her up the stairs by her hair. Melinda watched through squinting eyes as Watts jumped and clapped his hands, delighted by what he had wrought. Watts took up more belts and tied up Lori. Watts went to the bathroom. Melinda heard the sounds of the water running in the bathtub. Realizing her roommate was in grave danger, she struggled against her restraints until she was able to rise to a standing position. She went to a sliding door that opened up onto a balcony. She wanted to shout for help, but thought better of it, deciding the attacker would likely retaliate by killing one or both of them. She went back to her previous position. Watts stuck his head in the room. Pleased that everything was as he left it, he went back to the bathroom. Melinda realized her only option of finding help was to jump over the balcony. The problem was, they lived 13 feet from the ground. She decided it was worth it to risk injury to save two lives. She jumped. The impact was hard, especially when her foot spun around. She was in pain, but her veins were coursing with adrenaline, so it didn't hold her back. She ran to neighbors to summon assistance. When the police arrived, they assumed it was a domestic disturbance. They even went to the wrong door. They realized the true location when they heard Carl shouting. When he discovered Melinda had disappeared, he flew into a rage. He ran out of the apartment. One of the officers chased him. The other called for backup. Carl Watts's luck ran out. His car was parked by the police cruisers. He tried running in another direction, this time into the courtyard of an apartment complex. They pursued him there, where they trapped him in a dead end. Lori nearly died, but one of the officers managed to save her life. Though Texan prosecutors became aware of the murders of which Carl Watts was accused of committing in Michigan, they also knew that evidence linking him to those crimes and the crimes he was alleged to have committed in Texas were scant at best. They tried another tactic. They offered him a plea deal. If he confessed to the murders and disclosed the details of each, he would only be charged with burglary and intent to murder. In other words, he would not be punished for murder under the proviso that he confess. Burglary with intent to murder carries a 60-year sentence. It was that or face the possibility of the death penalty. Watts opted for the plea deal. He confessed to committing 12 murders in Texas. One snag that emerged was that the prosecutors in Michigan refused to accept the conditions of the plea deal. Those cases remained open. After admitting to 12 murders, he later claimed to have committed as many as 40, with a possible combined tally of 80. Some investigators believe he may have committed as many as 90 murders. After running his case through the Court of Appeals, it was ruled that the bathtub used during the burglary was not considered a deadly weapon. Watts' status was changed to that of a non-violent felon. Due to this, he was eligible for parole. This meant that, with a record of exemplary behavior as of 2004, he could be released from prison in 2006. Unwilling to accept this, the courts in Michigan launched a public appeal in hopes that anybody with first-hand knowledge of the murders in the greater Detroit area would come forward. As luck had it, a man named Joseph Foy claimed to see him kill a woman. He described Watts as having evil eyes. He claimed to have witnessed him kill Helen May Dutcher. After a trial in 2007, Carl Watts was finally found guilty of murder. He received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. He died a few months later of prostate cancer. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.